Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fearlessly Authentic. I am so happy to have you join me once again. And I have a wonderful guest here that I'm going to introduce in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to thank you for listening in and sharing, subscribing, reviewing on Apple Podcasts and everywhere else you can listen to this show. Um, I am also on YouTube for anybody who wants to watch the show and see what my guests and I look like, uh, please go to YouTube and just look for Jody Harrison Bauer, no hyphens, no nothing. But please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe because I love to hear from you. And your, your feedback is how I guide the show. So thank you so much for everything that I hear from you. And please just let me keep hearing from you because every single week, either myself or with my guests, we aim to educate, empower, entertain a little bit and inspire you so you can live a fearlessly authentic life because that's very important to me. And I feel that if we are not living in our truth and our truest power and taking risks to be that fearless person because I've always been such a scaredy cat to take risks, but that's when we grow. That's when we evolve into the person that we eventually want to become. We may not know who that person is, but eventually we become that person if we live fearlessly authentic. So I'm going to get right into the show because I'm excited. There's so much to share with my guest, Idan Ravine. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me. Um we just met recently and it was just such a pleasure to get to know him. And wow, there's just so much to share. To give you a little bit about Idan, he started his career as an attorney and now works with athletes, NBA, WNBA, players, and actors, teaching them, training them how to be the best players ever, whether they're acting in a show or they're playing in a real game. And this comes from a man who never played professional basketball, never played for the NBA, but has the skills and they're unconventional. And he's a very soft-spoken person as well. And we will, we're will we going to get right into what makes you different than the other trainers out there. Uh, is that my question? What makes me yes. different than the trainers? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, let's get right into that because you are known as the hoops whisperer and you wrote a book about that as well. But what 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 is the difference between you and everybody else out there? Um, I think I think part of that answer kind of is sort of contingent on my journey. So, um, you know, when I tell people what I do and I like to say like I specialize in sports and athletic performance. So I'm responsible for the physical, which is like the speed, the agility, the conditioning, the strength, the power, the technical elements of like how an athlete, like, let's say we refer to basketball, how they shoot, how they dribble, how they pass and the mental component and bridging them all together. That's kind of what I figure has become my expertise. But I think to understand like what distinguishes me, I think what's very important is to understand my journey because I think the journey is what makes us who we are. It's sort of the, uh, like I always say, like, you know, God gives us the ingredients, but not the recipe, right? So I think part of what we are is the recipe. And so, um, you know, when I tell people what I do, they often look at me like, there's no way, because I think they're expecting a six foot six guy with last name, David Sterner, Adam Silver, who the commissioner of the NBA, and some kind of relationship or some type of former athlete. And I say, no, that's not at all. Um, I grew up in a very religious family. My mom and dad have devoted their whole lives to teaching some form of Jewish education, whether that's the Old Testament or rabbinical commentary or Holocaust studies or Jewish history or Hebrew literature. So I grew up in a very religious home. And uh, for some reason, sports and basketball spoke to me in a way that nothing else ever has and ever, ever will, I don't think. Um, and But I didn't have many resources to become a better athlete or a better player. So I kind of taught myself everything. And I would kind of steal information wherever, wherever I could. I would stare at a Sports Illustrated page to understand how someone ran or shot or dribbled. And I just created for myself this system of like Idan, right? Which is how I made myself faster and stronger and a better basketball player. And I became a very talented athlete and a very talented player. But when you grow up the way I do, you don't have many options. You can either become a lawyer, a rabbi, a cantor, a doctor, engineer, or a teacher. Um, so I did what a good Jewish boy was supposed to do. And I buried my basketball in the backyard and I became a lawyer. 
but I was a very, very unhappy lawyer. Um, but when you tend to grow up like I do, you tend to see everything in the form of prayer. So I remember he's just sitting behind like my big lawyer desk in my big lawyer suit, staring at a pile, like staring at a pile of this big lawyer work. And I would just pray that God would send down a lightning bolt with like a yellow post note attached to it that would impale itself on my desk. And that would include a blueprint for my future. That I would do A to B to C to D. And I'm a very patient person. So I would wait and I would wait and I would wait. And there was never a lightning bolt. There was never a yellow post note. And there was never a blueprint. So I just continued with my life, not really knowing what I was going to do and how I was going to escape this like sort of miserable existence I had practicing law. And this doesn't mean law is a miserable profession. It just, for me, it didn't speak to my soul. And I felt like I was dying inside. So every morning before work, I would sort of self-medicate by running as much as I could and swimming as much as I could at a, at a local YMCA. This would allow me to get rid of all the nervous energy. So when I walked into the office, I could actually settle down and do some work. So one day, I saw an ad for a 12-year-old boys basketball team posted on a court board as I was leaving the YMCA. And I thought, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to write this number down. So I wrote the number down. I came into the office. I called and I volunteered. And uh, I knew it would get me out of the office a couple of days a week, which was important for me. But it was such a difficult place to work. I almost had to convince the senior partner to let me out of the office. So what I did was I said to him, this will be business development. So I paid to have the name of the firm stenciled on the kids' jerseys. So he would think, oh, this you're doing this for the, you know, for the firm. So it was a Tuesday night and a Saturday. And I just I mean, I'd never coached anyone. I never trained anyone. I didn't know what I was doing. And I just gave these kids drills I had created for myself when I was a kid. Maybe like shooting drills or running drills or dribbling drills or agility drills. And after a couple of weeks, you know, parents would start calling me and say, what are you doing with my son? And I'll say, look, lady, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, no, 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 you don't understand. My son is a spaz. My son gets attention. My son is difficult. And I've never seen my son so focused and engaged in anything in my in this entire life. What are you doing? I thought, well, maybe I just know more than the dad who's coaching his son's team because that's how it works at the YMCA's. So at the end of the season, um, I got a call from a parent. She asked me to come to practice early and I arrived early and I'd seen like all these kids had like uh, red cups and pizza boxes. And lo and behold, they had decided to throw me a pizza party. And I thought this is really strange because, you know, 12 year old boys, they buy video games with their allowance money and they don't throw a party pizza party for an adult who shouldn't be eating pizza in the first place. So afterwards, the parents pulled me aside and they said, I don't know what you're doing with my kids. Like, I've never seen them so focused and engaged. And so like, like uh, alive. And I thought, well, maybe I'm just a pretty good teacher because I inherited a teaching gene from my parents. So I continued to volunteer with these kids um, whenever I had free time. And then one day I came into the office early and I saw there was uh, my, my, uh, my phone was buzzing and I go into that and it's one of the senior partners. And so I go into his office and this was a guy that like, I always felt incredibly uncomfortable around. It was like, I was always second guessing myself. So he could have walked down the, down the hallway and asked me what time it was. I would have looked at my watch and said, you mean London, Paris or Los Angeles time? Like the simplest things got me frazzled because he just made me uncomfortable. So I go into his office and he's holding my memo and he's kind of hanging it. Like he's like shaking it like it's a flag. And I'm thinking, what's wrong? And he asked me a question, I answer it. And he keeps asking me the same question 10 times, each time escalating his, the decibel of his voice even higher. Right. At the 11th time I said to him, why are you busting my balls? If you want me to fix this, I will. If you don't want me to fix this, I won't. And it was the first time in three and a half years I ever uttered a peep. I never said anything in the office. I always ate it because that's what I was, thought I was supposed to do. So I saw him pick up the phone. I knew he was calling. He was calling human resources to say that I was being insubordinate. I walked into my office. I typed up a letter of resignation and I quit. And it, I felt so relieved. It was as if like 10,000 pounds of the worst smelling dog shit had been removed from my favorite pair of Jordans. Like I was so relieved that I was free of this. So now I'm like- Can I, what am let I, me hold that yeah. thought for a second. Yeah. So what, did your parents know? I know you were a grown man at the time, but you were like in your twenties, right? At, when yeah. this was going on. So did your parents know, it sounds like you were close to them. Um, did they know how unhappy you were as oh, a lawyer? Course. Of course, of course, okay. but when you grew up in a poor immigrant family, that, right. that how you feel is irrelevant because what matters when you grow up in a certain way is that do you have a 401k, do you have health insurance, do you have a desk, do you have a card, do you get a check every two weeks? And so like, that's all that matters to many people in this world. And for me, it's like, I was so desperate to get away. Mm -hmm. I would have had ramen noodles every week and I right. would have delivered the paper, right? For $10 an hour, just right. so I could have escaped and find, found like freedom. So, you know, I move home and I don't know what's going to do, what I'm going to do next with my life. 
and I'm like, you know, answering ads and I'm submitting my resumes and I'm going to these interviews, trying to find something other than law, but no one would give me a chance because they go, oh, you're law, you're, that's all you know, <clears throat> you should stay in law. So after five or six months, like my parents started giving me pressure, like you got to go back to law, you need a job, you have loans, blah, blah, blah. And so again, I did what a good Jewish boy was supposed to do. And I listened to my mom and I took a job in another law firm. Mm. But this place was super nice. It was like, they paid me well. I got to travel the world. They were very respectful. It was as if I'd gone from the ghetto to the White House. I mean, it was a really lovely place. But when I stripped away all the makeup, it was still the practice of law and I law and I just hated it. So I remember I would always you, just go ahead. Did you it was it law that you hated, or was it that you felt confined in something you didn't love? Well, it's all interconnected, right? So it, right. If, if, if substantively it doesn't work with you and the office doesn't work with you, like and it makes or, you miserable. It just makes you miserable, right? Yeah, I get and it. Yourself, like, I, I, I couldn't find joy in this, no matter how much everyone else found joy in it. Right. And when it's happening, when you have a job that you don't really like, you start indulging in all the accessories. So what, what people do is they'll, they'll, you know, they have a bigger lunch or there's a bigger dinner or you take a bigger vacation or you buy a different car. And so you start sort of like offsetting the true unhappiness with like small little things that you think could make you happy. And the reality was I, I wasn't willing to do that, right? Because I was like, I, I need to figure out like what is that I'm meant to do in my life? But the truth is um, those answers were so far away. I had no idea that they were actually in front of my eyes. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you because it sounds like this was the first time you sort of rebelled against what was expected of you. And sure. as a fellow Jewish person, I know what it's like to, and I'm the oldest, um, to listen to everything that my parents told me to do. I always wanted them to be proud of me. That was my goal. It may not sure. have been your goal. Um, and then, you know, it took me until I was in my 40s to rebel. So that's why I'm asking you it. You it must have felt a little uncomfortable. You didn't want to disappoint your parents. All those things must have been going through sure, your head, sure. right? But I, but I think, you know, like the, the, the words uncomfortable and comfortable and all that, you know, they become sort of like, you know, very common trendy words to yes. use now, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, when you're younger and you're growing up, th those aren't the words you use. You use no. the words, <laughs> use words miserable, unsatisfied. How am I getting out of here? I feel like I'm in prison. Like, is this really what I'm gonna do the rest of my life? Like, like the words comfortable and uncomfortable are sort of luxurious words that I feel like the rich use oftentimes, right? Mm -hmm. And I think- Yeah, so most, you, felt, you felt trapped. I, felt I mean, trapped. that's what I, that's how I felt in yes. my, yes, yes. Absolutely. So I understand, okay. Yeah, so I didn't know what to do. And so my salvation was always the basketball court. It was the park because this is what I knew as a kid. And like, I didn't grow up with much, but the ball was like my answer to everything. So I would go to the park and I would play alone or I would play. And it's just like, for those moments, like everything would stop. And so I did the same thing again. So at nights I would just go to the park or in the morning before I had to go to the office. And then one day I was at the park and I ran into a couple guys I used to play basketball with when we were kids. And years later, they were bigger, taller and faster. Now they were playing professionally overseas. And I don't know why I said this to them, but I said, hey, you wanna meet me in the gym tomorrow to work on a few things. And it was a million universes away from anything I could have anticipated where it would lead me to this day. So I said, they said, sure, because I had a lot of credibility because I knew them from the park. So we go to the gym and I gave these guys drills I had created for myself. Once again, running drills and conditioning drills and basketball related drills. And they said, this is great. Can I come back tomorrow? I said, you want to come back tomorrow? For sure, we can come back tomorrow. And then all of a sudden, more people would call, more people would call, more people would call. And like any free time I had, mind you, I was working 60 hours a week as a lawyer. At night, in the mornings, on the weekends, I would give to whoever called me. So then three and a half years later, after giving all this time, I was having lunch with my mom. And she asked me in this really thick Hebrew accent, do you charge the people that you work with? It was a very hard question for me to answer because my entire life I'd been making money doing what I hated. I couldn't imagine actually now getting paid to do what I would otherwise do for free. Right. So I was so afraid to raise the topic of money with any of these people because I thought that what I discovered that I love would disappear along with them. And then at the end of the conversation, she said to me, you know, you're only worth what these people are willing to pay for you. My mom and dad can quote Genesis, Deuteronomy, Proverbs, but they don't give you financial wisdom, right? But that right. nugget stuck with me. But I didn't have the courage to talk about money because I was terrified that it would everything would disappear along with it. Mm -hmm. So for like three or four months, like um, my mom's conversation sort of echoed in my brain like a hurricane. And I was like, she was right, but I just didn't have the courage to talk about it. And then one day I got a phone call from an NBA player and he said to me, would you make some time for me? And I said, of course I would. And at the end of the, at the, end of the conversation, I said to him as fast as I could, pay me whatever you think this is worth to you. 
he could have paid me with a bag of Starburst, half a dozen chocolate chip cookies, um, some ice cream. As long as I could have turned around and shown my mom this bag of sugar, she would have left me alone. And I said it to him as fast as I could, hoping he didn't hear me. And I didn't even know if he did hear me. And we made time to connect. So I worked with him that week. And afterwards, we were having lunch. And he took out an, a white envelope and he passed it across the table. And I opened the envelope and it was a check with more zeros than I'd ever seen. <clears throat> and I felt so uncomfortable because like my entire life, I've been making money doing what I would do for free. How can I now accept this money from someone right. that, like, I didn't feel was worthy of it? So I pushed it back across the table. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't accept this. And I started justifying why I couldn't accept it. I say, well, I never played college basketball. I never played in the NBA. I don't have a PhD in exercise science from Stanford. And I would give all these reasons why I couldn't accept it. And he said to me, no, this is what you were worth to me. And so I finally accepted the money. And so when I look back, it was a very, very poignant moment in my life because it marked this very circuitous internship I had in myself. I had finally developed the methodology, uh, a uh, expertise, um, a talent and something that I could monetize. And then shortly thereafter, I quit law. And, you know, I look back and I think I've lived the most unimaginable life. Like I have trained over 100 NBA players. I've trained more than a dozen NBA All-Stars, ranging from Steph Curry to LeBron James to Kobe Bryant. I've trained everyone. I've trained celebrities and actors and actresses. I've been on TV. I've written best-selling books. All these things have sort of opened up in my life because I finally have the faith in myself to say, you know what, like I can do this. But never in this process was it ever motivated by money or a business plan or anything. It was the last thing on my, that I ever even thought about was whether this is about money. So when people often ask me about like, um, you know, what they want to do, and I, I always answer the question is that like, you have to completely remove money from this equation, because if you do, it's not really necessarily what you want to do, you know? And so that's sort of kind of how I got to be where I am. Um, I'm, I'm so happy you brought up the, that whole money transaction, that issue, because I think so many people feel uncomfortable taking their something that they love doing and charging for it. I know that when I first got into the fitness industry, yeah. people were like, hey, how do I eat like this? How do I train like this? What do I do? And I felt the same way, like sure. kind of uncomfortable because it was something that I loved doing and I thought I'll give it out freely and then I realized there were all these people out there making all this money and I was doing a much better job than them. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure you yeah. felt the same way until somebody like this player says, no, right. this is your value. And maybe that's what people like us needed to say, oh, okay. Yeah. This so no, absolutely, you're absolutely right. We're on the same page here. I think I remember, you know, I do a lot of corporate speaking around the world and I remember someone asked me a question and they asked me sort of like, how do I frame my, like my journey in a certain way? And I called it like sort of the journey of cornbread. And um, I remember I, I actually wrote a children's book about sort of this idea called It Takes Patience. Right. And sort of my philosophy is this, right? Let's say you really, really love baking cornbread and you're not very good. But if you spend enough time baking the cornbread, you're going to get pretty good at it, right? And then when you get pretty good at it, you're going to have enough confidence to say, you know what? I might add a jalapeno to it. I might add some cheddar cheese to it. I might add my special sauce. I'm going to make it pretty good. And then you get to a point where you feel pretty confident with it. And then one day you get invited to a party and your friends say, hey, will you bring your cornbread? You say, of course, I'll bring my cornbread. And then you bring your cornbread. And then, then a couple of weeks later, someone invites you and says, hey, your cornbread is so good. Will you come to my dinner party and bring your cornbread? And you say, of course I will. I love sharing my cornbread. And then five months later, the most unexpected thing happens. You get invited to another dinner party and someone says, will you bring your cornbread? And you say, of course I'll bring my cornbread because I love making cornbread and I love sharing cornbread. And you go to this party and there's some people there that you don't really recognize and everyone's eating your cornbread and then you leave. And a week later, you get a phone call and the woman says, hi, my name is Jody. I was at the party. I really enjoyed your cornbread. Can I order four loaves from you? And you say, what do you mean order four loaves? She says, yeah, I'd like to pay you $4,000 for your cornbread. Can I order four loaves? And at that moment, you say, wait a minute, what's going on? Well, that's how I see, that's how my life's been, how your life's yes. been. I think that's how it should be, right? It's the idea of discovering your cornbread. And you don't do it for money. You do it because you truly love doing it. And then eventually someone offers to pay you for your cornbread and then you have a business. And it does take patience as the name of your book yes. is. Yes. It does take patience. I'm 61 and I'm, I'm very, very patient because I've had many different chapters in my life. And I just, you know, one of the things I learned by competing in fitness shows is blinders on, nose to the grindstone, stay focused on what you're doing. 
Don't right. look at anything else. Don't look behind you. Don't look in front of you. Just focus on what it is that you love to do and how well you're going to do it. Just like the cornbread, that's right? The cornbread. And that's, that's the I, example I give for everybody. Just you find your cornbread and you make it as good as you can and the best as you can. And it's going to be shitty in the beginning. And it's going to be okay after a year. And then eventually it's going to be really, really good. And at that moment, you're going to share it. And then one day God's going to bless you and someone's going to offer to pay for it. And that's how I live my life. And that's how I encourage people to live their lives. Make beautiful cornbread. Two things. I saw a video of a little girl with her mom making cornbread. Yeah. Uh, it was so cute. And, you know, it was because of the book. It was just so adorable. Empowering this little girl. She probably was maybe five years old, six years old. Yeah. And when I saw it, my heart just, you know, got really big because I have two daughters. They're 29 and 33. But I know what it was those little steps of accomplishment. Let's make this. I had one daughter who liked to cook more than the other one. And I'm not much of a cook or a baker or anything like that. But yeah. we did it because I did it with her because it was important to her. And we both grew from that experience. Sure. But again, I love that you brought in the patients because everybody wants everything to happen so fast that they're, they, they want to skip all the messy parts. And it's the, you know, again, these are words that are thrown around a lot. I know from talking to you that yeah. you and I just don't like words that are being thrown around a lot because then they lose yeah. their meaning. But there is that mess, you know, there is that messy part of being patient, you know, and uh, judging yourself and saying, you know, I can't do this. Maybe my cornbread isn't good. No, I'm not going to bring it to the party. But sure. Um, but, but, but that's but that's that's the thing. It's like if you are trying to find a return and investment on your time, you've picked the wrong thing because the joy is in the process. The joy is in the doing. So if you're expecting to get ten dollars in your cornbread after two months, you're entitled and it's the wrong business for you. So what I always tell people, it's very fundamental. It's like truly you have to lock into what you enjoy, no matter how silly it might sound to somebody else. If you like to make pottery, you like to make soap, you like to tell stories, you like to juggle, you like to play harmonica, whatever it is, you just got to be good at it. And you got to like, and the joy is in that process. The joy is in finding discipline. The joy is in accepting the struggle. And sometimes you get blessed. Sure. Sometimes you don't get blessed. Sure. But that's why you have to truly love what you're doing in order for this whole thing to all make sense. Do you take that, how do you transfer that philosophy of patience into what you do with your athletes or actors? So, so I, like, I, I'm very upfront with these athletes, right? They're all like very, very, very special and physically gifted, right? But what will make them the best of the best of the best of the best is truly like having joy in the struggle and like loving the work and the process, right? And again, some of them are so gifted, they don't necessarily have to. I mean, like go back to high school or college. There was always that person in school that didn't have to study much and always got the A. And many of these people are very much like that. But if you truly love the process, your goal will be an A plus and your goal to be do things that are revolutionary. And so it's that 1% that I'm looking for, which is they truly love this space and they want to do something that's absolutely revolutionary. And that's kind of where, that's where like I find that we're kindred spirits. It's like finding those type of people that want to be super special because they truly love this. It's hard to love the process. I know I'm, I'm learning how to dance, Latin dancing. Sure. And I, I have a love hate relationship with the process. Sure. Luckily sure. I have a very patient instructor but it's, he's tough and he's mean to me, not really mean, but mean yeah. because he expects a lot and he knows what I could do. So what happens when you come across an athlete who's not, you know, is super gifted because they all are, but right. doesn't love that process. How do you, how do you get his or her well, head out of the game? Well, I, I think it's more like, I don't want to try to convince anyone of loving anything. It's either in you or not but I still have a responsibility to try to maximize their gifts and optimize their performance, which I can do well, right? But I think to find that real level of enlightenment and that real special, special place in life, you have to love something. And I think oftentimes when people want to kind of like, uh, when they say they don't like the struggle, I, I, I kind of take people back to school, which is like, you study for a reason, right? Because studying is not easy and it's a struggle, but you do it because it increases your chance of getting a better grade. It's not a guarantee you get an A. It's not a guarantee you get a C. But if you don't do it, I can assure you the chances and the probability get much smaller and much slimmer. 
So if you want to roll the dice on yourself and you want to like kind of find that place of enlightenment and fulfillment, well, it's going to be paved with a lot of struggle, a lot of tears, a lot of difficulty, but you just kind of have to accept that that's what that is. So even on in a fitness level, like I always tell people like, embrace that fatigue because at least it means you're doing something embrace those tears because it means at least you're being vulnerable like you have to really embrace those very dark deep uncomfortable i hate the word uncomfortable but those places where you feel very vulnerable because that is really truly how you get better and i think like you know sports is a very easy metric to evaluate because you know your percentages go up or your scoring percentages go up or your contracts get bigger but in real life it's hard for people to measure their growth Yes. Right. So oftentimes since it's the gym, do my scale go from 118 to 114? Does my waist size go from 26 to 24? But there's many people around the world that don't know how to measure that growth. And so that's why they stop because they're like, why am I, why am I, why am I doing this? What's the point? And I think that is where it gets sad because it's like, the point is, is that the struggle will eventually lead you somewhere special. I don't know where, but it always does. I agree. And I run into that with, with the clients that I train. And that is why we have, I have to hold them accountable because there's got to be some type of measurement to show their growth. Otherwise, as you just said, they'll stop because they don't, they don't see the growth. They don't see the change, whether it's better, quote unquote, better or worse. Right. But sometimes sometimes the growth is not measurable. And that's what for many people it is because the gym is almost an easy place to show growth. Sometimes in an office when you're not getting recognized or sometimes in a difficult relationship and you're trying and you don't see that growth. That's where the growth has to feel internal, which is, am I becoming more disciplined? Am I becoming more serious? Am I working towards something? Even though I don't know what it is, am I becoming more faithful? Am I becoming kinder? There are sort of these softer metrics that to use to evaluate this struggle. And I think those are all very, very important. I completely agree. And that's why I'm so happy you're a guest here. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back in a few minutes with Idan Ravine. Be right back, everybody. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. I am with Idan Ravine, who is known as the Hoops Whisperer and trainer to the celebrities, the stars. He trained athletes, MBA, WNBA, actors, executives. And I wanted to ask you, yeah. how, do, how do you change the way you train from an athlete to an actor to an executive? So the work I do falls under sort of the title of performance. So in, in when you talk with athletes, there's a level of sports performance and athletic performance. So my goal is not to like narrow their waistline or to make them like necessarily look more attractive. My goal is to figure out how do you get Cristiano Ronaldo to score six goals? How do you get a famous basketball player to score 40 points? How do you get like, like, it's just, how do you get them to perform better in their particular sport? So the training is an emphasis on performance based. So if I would walk into a gym and I'd see someone using those battle ropes, right? My question I always ask myself is, unless I'm an equestrian, I don't know how the battle rope helps the people I work with, right? So it's like, how do you take the activity, the program and translate it so that it moves the needle in their particular sports? Because I'm not concerned whether they're conditioned, because I know everything they're going to do with me will make them very well conditioned. Right. But how does the program I create move them in a space and what they learn from me so that they perform actually better in their sport. When I work, I work with a lot of very famous musicians and actors. And again, they they also fall under the the heading of performance. So when I work with very famous musicians that are going on tour, well, they have to have two hours of very strong lungs or otherwise they can't maintain the cadence and the breath of when they sing and when they dance. So it's, so it becomes a level of performance on that side with programming geared towards what they're going to be doing, how they're going to be doing it, how to maintain that level of enthusiasm and joy and fun and breathing that's necessary. Then when you look at executives, it's very similar. They also have sort of performance goals as well. So I think oftentimes they're very, very competitive. And so they want to measure their success in the particular sport that they play. So if it's golf or if it's tennis, there's a performance based. Recently, I started working with some very like world renowned, like highly ranked tennis players. And I don't know the first thing about a ground stroke or a forehand, but I do understand performance and movement and biomechanics enough to understand, hey, there's something that you're doing is holding you back from being a much better player. So you might be four in the world, but there's three reasons why you're not Nadal, Djokovic, and uh, whoever's number three, right? So it's just trying to figure out what is holding someone back from that piece. 
I think uh, performance is oftentimes very physical, right? And it's physiological, but I think there's also a very big mental piece involved. And I often find that the, what happens is that people become so uh, tuned into industry custom or what they've been doing that they think that because they haven't mastered that, that that's why they're failing instead of questioning whether what they're doing is incorrect and old. Mm -hmm. And so I find that uh, I, I'm unconventional on purpose because I think that the uh, there's just too much of the same old, same old being articulated and regurgitated in sports or in athletics or in fitness or in performance. It's it's what my coach taught me, what I played, who I'm repeating to my coach, to my pupil, to my this. And it's like this 10 commandment that gets passed on and no one really questions it and understands it. And to me, it became very, very clear when I was working with this tennis player that he would say to me, well, this is what I've done. This is what they do on the tour. This is what we do. And I'd say like, but why? He didn't have an answer. And the answer was just because. And so it made him really rethink that, um, are these things actually necessary and are they moving the needle? And so when people ask me about unconventional tactics, the answer is yes, because I will always challenge custom because I don't understand it unless you can point to science behind it or like very strong anecdotes or some performance basis behind it. I don't, I think all of it is just a lot of fluff and makeup. Um, and so that's become very much the basis of a lot of my work is that I will challenge everything. But you do have the the education behind you you have a bachelor of science in kinesiology oh actually i have a master's in i have a master's degree in kinesiology i have a law degree i have a degree in finance i have a degree in marketing i have marketing, very advanced right. yeah i have a very advanced exercise science certifications and licenses yeah i'm very 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 knowledgeable but however but when i started this i wasn't mm -hmm. when right. i started this i had very strong intuition and i had a lot of faith in myself and I was very good at questioning things that didn't make sense to me because I trust myself. And I think part of this growth in ourselves is having a lot of faith in ourselves. And people oftentimes think faith is this religious word. It's not. I, when I was growing up and I grew up very religious, that's what faith meant to me. But as I got older, faith is faith in yourself, faith that you'll find a way to pay your rent, faith in the, in the heavens, faith that you'll end up doing what you love. And so part of this process is learning to develop faith in yourself. And so when you see something that doesn't make sense, you don't need to have like a PhD in exercise science from Stanford to question it. Over time, if you want to be more of a scientist and more of a five-star chef, yes, you do need to be able to pair your, your hypothesis and intuition with some, with some science. And that's why I become very well educated in the space. But it doesn't mean you can't do it. The goal is for people to trust their instincts. And I find that oftentimes people are making the same tomato soup over and over and over and over and over because someone told them that that tomato soup is the gold standard. For me, there is no gold standard. It's constantly moving. It constantly moves per person, per activity, per sport. There is nothing that is this optimal thing. It is this very uh, uh, like elusive thing that we're supposed to figure out and chase. And so if I have questions or I create programs, it's always rooted in science, but it's also rooted in my intuition. And that's what I wanted everybody to know, that you're just not this person who just came up with all of these ideas, that you actually have the science and the knowledge behind you, but you're also very creative and you approach things so differently yes. and it's so refreshing. And that's why you're getting such great results with the people that you work with, which is why you're in such high demand. Oh, and I appreciate it. So that's, that's like, no matter what we do, I think that it's very always important to question it without sounding insubordinate, right? So yes. the struggle I always had with corporate America was that it's this idea that you have to accept what we do because that's what, how we do it, right? And I think a lot of times there's a lot of inefficiencies in that process. And so when I, if I'm on working with people and I'm managing hundred people, I don't try to tell them how to do it. I have enough trust in them to help them figure out, like you can figure out how to handle it. Just give me an answer. I don't need to question your process. And I think oftentimes the process is just, it's inefficient and it's not always accurate. And no matter what profession people are in, I just encourage them to ask them why, right? And, but not, but not be a, but not be a problem identifier, but be a problem solver. So if you're going to ask why, you have to know, you have to have an answer for that afterwards. Well, right, and we both know people who just ask questions just to be a pain in the ass. Yes, you know, just to be annoying and a pain in the ass. But the the key, the people that really are truly changing the world, are the people who are asking why and coming up with a better. Yeah. A better that's reason when I the alternative exactly, and that's yes. why if, you, if you're going to ask, if you ask the question, you better have an answer to follow up. The answer doesn't have to be right or wrong, but you can't constantly be the one saying why, 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 and not have to have a follow up with an answer, right? And so for me, I've always been very proud of the fact that I'm a problem solver. Mm -hmm. So I can, like, as a lawyer, I learned how to issue spot and find issues, and now as a civilian, I feel like I've discovered ways of answering questions and answering problems. And the other 
thing that um, makes you stand out is the fact that you think like this, whereas there are other coaches, trainers that just do the same things over and over again. You're also sure. soft-spoken. Now, and I was wondering, is that really who you are? Or do you do this only with the athletes and you're screaming at other people no, at never, home? No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't yell at all. I don't find it to be, that's not, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It doesn't work for me. So mm-hmm. I have no interest in raising my voice. To my, are my words powerful? Sure. Do they pierce? Sure. Do I say something that like, doesn't make you feel that good? Sure. But it's never done with malice. It's always done with the eye of how do I make this better and how do I improve the situation? So I speak with a lot of honesty and I speak sharp, but I don't raise my voice. I don't curse at people. I don't find that's a way of motivating because I've been around those kind of people and a lot of people don't respond that way. Um, I think that every person, you have to be sensitive enough to understand how they learn, how they respond, how they react. Some athletes, if, if I have to be around an athlete likes to be coached hard, I'm not the right person for it because I will never motherfuck you. I will never curse at you. I will never belittle you. I will never embarrass you, right? If that's what you need, then we're not the right fit, right? And I've, have you found that, that you've had some mismatches because somebody wants to be yelled at or well, cursed yeah, at? Well, yeah, but I, but I also see that kind of person too. It's, they're not necessarily intrinsically motivated. And so right. I, you're, right. you're, you've already created a cap on what you want to be. And I don't mm-hmm. want to be in a gym being Tony Robbins. That's not who I am, right? I'd rather be in a, in a room just trying to help someone who wants to help themselves. But I also right. think too that there is, um, I think that, you know, helping people requires a level of compassion and, and gentleness and sensitivity as well. So um, like I always help, like I always hold a hand or give a towel or give a water. Like I'm very sensitive to the process, but at the same time, it's very important to push someone to a point where um, they are challenged, but don't think something feels impossible. And oftentimes in gym space, I love that. I I love that. Can you say that one more time? Because I think that's huge. Yeah. So what I have found a lot of the times in like sort of the health and wellness space is that people will measure the, the efficacy of a session by like how much someone threw up or how exhausted they are. To me, that's the completely wrong message and the wrong metric. What's very important for me is that someone, I push someone to a point that was possible, but they didn't think was possible. So I get them to that line, but I don't make it impossible because I can make I can make everything impossible for everyone. The best athletes in the world in five minutes, I can challenge you and make you puke. But that's right. not a, that's not being an effective like trainer or performance expert. So I get you to a point where I'm challenging you, and then the next day you're excited to be there again. And too often people want to make things exhaustive or throw up or like and like debilitating. I'm thinking you're not doing anything except breaking them down. Look, if we're talking war and military, it's a whole different conversation of what right. you have to do to motivate and push. That's life or death. We have to take people to different limits. But for most 99% of the world, that experience should not feel that way, right? That experience should feel challenging, but rewarding, challenging, but inspiring, challenging, but fun, challenging, but grateful. And sometimes people just put the accelerator too far. And I'm thinking that's an inexperienced trainer or that's an old school trainer. You want them to come back. I know that I push my clients as much as I can, knowing each one is very different, but I always want them to come back and leave feeling accomplished. Now, when I first started my career, the goal was to make everybody puke, right? So this is 33 years ago. Yeah. Make them puke, make them puke, make them puke. I can, just like you said, I can make everybody puke. In five minutes, easy. Right. In five minutes. But like, that's not, that's not what I wanted to do. And I found it extremely like unfulfilling. So I totally get it. I, and and, and I, yeah. And I think even to start to interrupt, I think there's a very simple comparison, right? No matter what restaurant you go to, there'll always be a basket of bread. Why? Because when you leave and you had the bread, you feel full, you assume that the meal was good. This is the same sort of misnomer when you walk into a gym. If you feel fatigued and exhausted, then that worked. And the reality is that's not the feeling that you're looking for, oh, right? I wish everybody could hear us say this, please. Right. It's, it's, like... the wrong, it's the wrong factor to identify whether something has merit or not. In a restaurant, feeling full is not the right one. And in a gym, feeling exhausted is not the right one. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, one of the things that uh, you have said to me is that um, your goal is to be compelling and inspiring. And I love, you know, I think we both want to inspire others, but to be compelling that like, that really hits my heart hard because that's deep, that's meaningful. That's so many different feelings. It's heartfelt, it's determination, it's discipline. 
explain to me what compelling means to you and what you mean by how you want to be compelling and inspiring. So like when I write books, my goal for the reader is that I want them to laugh, I want them to cry, I want them to feel a goosebump. That's compelling to me. That's compelling literature, that's compelling narrative, that's, com that's compelling context. And so when, when my responsibility is to be compelling, I want you to laugh, I want you to cry, I want you to feel goosebumps, I want you to feel inspired. Those are my fiduciary responsibilities to whoever I work with in whoever setting I want to be. And that's how I define being compelling. Okay. I want to walk away and someone doesn't go, oh, that's the guy with the bald head. They go, no, that's Idan, right? And to leave my mark and my fingerprints all over the refrigerator, right? That's what I want to do. In terms of inspiring, I'm not the guy that cut off his arm hanging off a rock for 124 hours and I'm in a movie about. What I am is a person who's lived, a regular person who's lived a very irregular life because I found that I have a lot of faith in myself and I'm very persistent and I'm very stubborn and I will find a way in universes that I don't traditionally shouldn't belong in and I'll find a way to excel because that's just who I am. And so um, I'm never the smartest person in the room. I'm never the tallest person in the room. I'm never the most handsome room person in the room. I'm never any of those things in the room, but my goal is to just find a way to just thrive um, because I'm doing it my way. How do you get the people that you work with who don't know you, who may not be sure that you're the right person to work with, to have faith in what you are bringing to the table to help them elevate themselves as better human beings? Well, I, I, that's a great question. So I think, um, you know, you would hope that, you know, a resume would be helpful that people know that what you've done in your credential and education that would build a little bit of trust. And the second thing is that I believe in my gospel so much within five seconds, you'll know whether I'm selling you magic beans or not, right? The question is whether you're going to be able to handle my gospel. And so that's where it becomes, that's why it's not always the right fit. So it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't ever question my ability or what I can do or how I can help you. It's whether like I am the right fit for this, this particular person. And I've learned to realize that I might, I'm not for everybody. And that's not a reflection on them. It's not a reflection on me. It's just how it is, right? Like right. some people, you know, love a certain movie and some people don't, right? Doesn't mean the bad movie is bad. No, it's not means it's good. It's just the way it is. And so- um, Personally, one size fits all never fits for me. It never, it never does, right? And so that, that's, the, you know, that's why it's, you know, that, that's why there's Walmart and Target, right? I'm not that, you know, like I've always considered myself more Harry Winston than Tiffany's. If you're walking into Harry Winston, you're not walking into Tiffany's. If you're walking into Tiffany's, you're not walking into Harry Winston. And not because like I am this extraordinary person. It's just more in terms of like what fits and what doesn't fit. I think in terms of like universal messages, that's a whole different conversation. That's why I write books. That's why I speak. That's why I go around the world and talk to people. Because I think there's universal lessons that we can learn from someone's struggle. Because I've struggled a whole fucking lot. And also from someone's success as well. And I think coming from a person that is very normal looking and normal size and normal this, and I don't come from privilege, I didn't go to Harvard, I don't have any of these traditional things, and I still found a way to make it, then I hope that inspires people to say, you know what, I don't need to have that kind of resume or that kind of money or that kind of relationship to move ahead in my life. Let's talk about your book, your best-selling book, The Hoops Whisperer. Can you tell us what sure. that is about. Yeah. So the hoops whisper and sort of on a macro level is about, um, you know, the importance of relying on faith and intuition to find your purpose in life, but faith and not in a religious context. So when I grew up, I grew up very religious. So faith always meant to me, God, religion, prayer, blah, 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 blah. But as I got older, I started realizing that faith meant faith in myself, faith in humanity, faith in the heavens, faith that I'll find something I love to do and I'll be able to pay my rent with it. It's that faith kind of sort of changed its meaning. And then also the importance of relying on intuition. So I think we all have this spidey sense. We just don't trust it, right? And, it's, uh, and I think if more people learn to honor it, they'd be able to kind of find more clarity. You know, to me, with my intuition, I'm not distracted by what other people are doing. I'm not distracted by what's popular or what's not popular, or how people perceive me. I just get a feeling and I, uh, I kind of run with it. And for me, you know, being able to find success in a world I don't necessarily belong in is because I relied on faith and intuition to try to get me there. Um, like I said, I don't, didn't have this very traditional background. So I met with a million skeptics that say, what, what do you know? You never wore a jersey. As if like wearing a jersey gives you a monopoly on wisdom. But I learned very quickly on that if you're smart and you have intuition and you trust yourself and you're unconventional and you're able to connect with people, you can find your own success. And so like I remember in my book, you know, I was talking about the idea that I got tired of trying to try knock on doors to convince people what I was. So instead, I built my house, my own, no matter how small it was, it was my own. 
And so I've just never been one to say, hey, look at me, give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance, because they would never give me the chance. So I was determined to do what I loved. And so instead of knocking on Universal's music chance, give me a chance, I'll make my own, I'll make great songs for you. I chose to record my own, if you understand that metaphor. And so that's where oftentimes people get discouraged because they're trying to get the institution to recognize them and acknowledge them and say, you can do it, you can do it. The reality is oftentimes they don't. That doesn't mean you quit. You just build your own house. I get it. I mean, I've been building my own house for 20 years now, you know, doing things that people are telling me I was too old for doing things like get off the stage in those stripper heels and that bikini, Jody, you're too old to be competing in fitness shows at 49 years old. Oh, wait a minute. No, don't tell me that because I'm going to win. Of course, you know, I'm going to win all the time. And You know, and not knowing again, you know, sort of what you're talking about, trusting your intuition. You don't know where this is going to lead you. All you knew is that this is something you enjoy. This is something you were good at and look where it's taken you. And that's where faith comes in. Right. 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 Faith takes you like, I don't, I can't see that far ahead, but I, this feels good to me and I enjoy it. And so I'm going to kind of listen to this and intuition is not, no, you don't have 75 years of experience in exercise science, but there was something about things that worked for you and made sense and you understood. And so you just kind of trusted yourself. Right. And look where it got you. I mean, like you went over and over and over and over and over and over. Right. So obviously there's something about your, your hunch is correct. Do you um, ever get scared about looking ahead or how do you, how do you look at your future? How do you look at your life? Are you here now and don't look forward or oh, back? I mean, I'm human. Like I, of course, of course I look forward to ahead and go, oh my God, what's next? I don't know. I don't know. I've been self-employed a long time. Like I, I don't have a cushion. I don't have a net. I'm, you know, I don't come from a wealthy family. I, so of course I'm human. I, I, I have that stuff happen to me all the time, but it's also the faith as well, which is like, I know I'm going to be okay. I know I'm going to be okay. I know I'm going to be okay. And it's kind of always reminding myself, I know I'm going to be okay, right? Because I know that with hard work and with diligence and looking for opportunity and never quitting, that only good will come of it. Will I win the $50 million lottery? Probably not. Will I own a $25 million home in Beverly Hills? Probably not. But that's not part of my journey. That's not who I am, right? The reality is like I learned to take one step in front of the other and hoping that every step leads me to a more beautiful step and a more beautiful step into a more beautiful garden to another rose it's like i just i look for small wins like that and that's right. kind of what keeps me sort of peaceful i love that i we only have four minutes left in the show i can't believe yeah. it i wanted to ask you um real quickly a few other questions sure. if we can get to them um what is the biggest lesson you've learned from any of the mba players that you've trained um so it's interesting. So I was speaking at a conference in Florida amongst the really, really smart private equity, venture capital, finance guys, right? And, and gals. And someone in the audience asked me, you know, what makes a particular very special NBA player very special? Someone I worked with for many years. And I said, they believe that their missed shot is better than your made shot. And it almost didn't make sense. Like, how is that possible? But what, I'm, what that example is, is that they have such unwaverable confidence in themselves mm-hmm. that they believe that even their miss will be better than your make, right? And I think that that's what makes the many of them so inspiring is because you cannot phase them. They believe so fundamentally in their ability and no matter what happens, they will not waver. And that's what many of them are very, very special, but you, lo- you, you lose sight of their inspiration because... The world has become very vain and social media based and like, look what I have and don't have. But right. my deepest connections with them is that in very quiet, closed gyms and dinners and lunches and planes with them where we have those conversations. And that's where they're very inspiring to me is that they never, ever waver. Wow. Wow. That's pretty powerful. And then one last question for you. Sure. What does it mean to you to live a fearlessly authentic life? Um, so that's what I've been doing most of my life is trying to live an authentic life. It sounds that way. I think the idea of living a fearless life is impossible, right? I think instead I tell people to embrace the fact that there is uncertainty and there's fear and it's just the way it fucking is. 
right? But that should not be the reason you don't move forward. So the idea that like there's not going to be discomfort or we should be courageous or we should be fearless, I feel it's impossible, right? The reality is to embrace the fact that you will feel tired and you will feel lost and you will grieve and you will, be, you will have fear and you will do all those things, but you still got to move forward. Right. And that's the part where I think people get lost because they think it's going to be this. If I embrace this mantra, I will be impervious. I will be Superman. I will be, a, you know, there's no such thing as Krypton. It won't bother me. But the truth of the matter is we're not Superman. So we're going to have all these things that come up in life. And you just have to understand the fact that it is just the spinach you got to eat. Great. It's the spinach you got to eat. Yeah. Yeah, and the ones that do it rise above, right? Yes, yes. and then that's mean that people can't, but right. the reality is it's, it's what you learn when you're a kid. You got to eat the spinach. That's just how life is. Exactly, exactly. Any um, any guesses? I don't know if that's the right word on who's going to win the playoffs. Oh, you no, know, I just want, you know, I, I don't really root for teams. I just hope my players do really well. So, okay. yeah, I hope all of them do really well and like they shine and, you know, I'll be very proud of them. Thank you so much for being on the oh, show. My pleasure. Uh, how does somebody get in touch with you? Can uh, buy your books? What's the best way? Sure. So the book is called The Hoops Whisperer. Um, it did really well, so it sold out. Uh, but it's always available on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. Mm -hmm. um, there's an audible version. There's a paperback. There's a Kindle and there's a hardcover. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, you can always do that via my social media. It's at Idan Wan, I-D-A-N-W-A-N. You can also reach me on Twitter, Idan Ravine, Facebook, Idan Ravine. And I have a website, EdanRavine.com, that kind of sort of shares a little bit of my beliefs and systems and kind of ideas and some of the press I have. And I really, truly try to answer everyone that reaches out to me. So know that like, if you reach out and have a question or a comment, I will 99.99999% get back with you unless like, you know. Thank, thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you, Don Ravine. Thank you so much for being on Fearlessly Authentic. Thank you everybody for joining us. Until next week, go live a fearlessly authentic life. Bye-bye. Right. Bye you guys.